Okay, we've got about four more minutes and we'll get started with our giraffe program. We're glad to have so many of you here today. Um, this is great to have a good crowd. I hope you all are enjoying the book um, and that you are enjoying the programming that our committee has planned around this. Welcome, we're glad you're here as people keep coming in. We have a few people here with us in the Herring Center. So we are um, have people joining us all different ways and we are glad that you are all here. We are recording today. So anyone who misses this can see it on our YouTube channel later on. Or if you wanna go back and catch up with some things you didn't catch the first time, you can watch it again. <laughs> If you would please, if you're not muted, go ahead and mute yourself. I'm trying to meet everybody as they come in here. Well, I think she's at the zoo with the giraffes. We've got two more minutes and then we're going to hand it over to our um, zoo educator at the Greenville Zoo to learn about the giraffes. And she has a great program planned for us. We are muting everybody as you come in so that we don't have you know, the doorbell and the phone and all that, dogs barking um, during our program. If you have questions during the program, you can put those in the chat and we will take care of those that way. It's great to see such a big crowd. This is wonderful. Well, we have 68 participants here and really more than that. So we've got people in the Herring Center watching and I know we have some of our screens have two people. So we have a great crowd today. It is three o'clock. Um, I'm Nancy Kennedy and so glad that you are here to join us for this program as part of our Read and Explore with Ollie program. This is our sixth, sixth year we've done this. I know many of you are enjoying reading um, Weft with Giraffes. And or maybe have already finished it, and we're glad you're here for this program. I would like to thank the Read and Explore with Ollie Committee for putting this together, and specifically Barbara Yance, who found the um, zoo program and put it together for us. We are recording right now, and if you have questions during the program, the best way to ask them is through the chat. Just type them into the chat, and at the appropriate time, I will read them to our speaker so that she can answer those. Um, please don't unmute, and um, we do have an hour um, with our speaker, so we want to give her as much time to give us information. This, they've got a great program planned for us. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to zoo educator Maxine Van Dam, and she will take it away. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Maxine Van Dam. I'm a zoo educator here at the Greenville Zoo. Uh, we're a small zoo that's located in downtown Greenville. If you haven't been here, I highly recommend that you come and take a visit for yourself. Um, we are a tiny zoo. Uh, we actually only occupy about nine acres, though our entire zoo is 12 acres in total. Um, even though we are tiny, we are pretty mighty. We're a part of a big accreditation community. That's called the AZA. So that's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So all the impact that we make right here in Greenville from our tiny zoo can make global impact through the way that we work with our AZA accreditation organizers. Um, so I know you guys are here to see giraffes um, and you're seeing a human. So I am going to go ahead and flip over to our stars. Um, we will have... Uh, as close as they'll allow us to come. Uh, we definitely have some interest from our male Miles right now. Um, he sees me out here talking on the phone and he doesn't know why we're not telling him how handsome he is today. Uh, Miles is our large male and his lady friend back there is Autumn. She's in the middle and their daughter is right there on the left hand side. Her name is Providence. Providence will actually celebrate her one year birthday the day after President's Day. Uh, we will be having a lovely birthday party for her thrown by our fabulous keepers if anyone wants to come by and celebrate our giraffes. Now why you guys are here is you're reading an incredible story about giraffes. Um, I am only about halfway through, so please no spoiler alerts, but Westwood Giraffes by Linda Rutledge is about a giraffe that was wild caught imported to the United States via the East Coast, and then travels on an incredible journey uh, with a young boy during the Depression era to California, as he would call it. And while giraffes are still transported today, we do it for very different reasons. Uh, because we were able to learn from the past, we also transport them in a very different way. But first, uh, what is a giraffe? What is a Maasai giraffe particularly for today? Um, we are looking at an extremely awesome species of giraffe, the Maasai. They're actually the most rare species that we have right here in Greenville. Um, Maasai giraffes, like the ones that we see today, um, they, they've been separated for about 2,000 years from every other species. Um, for a while, we thought, you know, a giraffe is a giraffe. It's just one of a kind. Uh, they are separated geographically, but, you know, they're pretty much the same. And after being able to test them genetically, we were able to discover that there's really four specific species of giraffe. That's going to be your reticulated, your southern, your northern, and the Maasai giraffe. You can even get more intense and look at subspecies with different colorations and smaller geographically locations uh, that these guys will be in pockets in. But for the most part, um, you have four major species. Out of those four major species, the Maasai is the most endangered and the most rare, unfortunately. Now, when we think about what these guys are, how they're separated, we're going to take you way, way, way back to understand how giraffes came to be. About 27.6 million years ago, uh, give or take, the Okapi and giraffe lineage split from the cattle lineages. So when we think about our larger groups of animals um, as hoofstock, that is that time when they started to drift off. About 20 to 25 million years ago, they then split off from the larger hoof lineage. That's going to be a lineage that included animals like the moose. And then about 11.5 million years ago, giraffes split off from their closest relative, the okapi. Now, while we don't have an okapi here at the Greenville Zoo, you can see the closest okapi to us at Riverbank Zoo and Gardens. They look a lot similar in the shape and body to our giraffes, but they have a stripy rump instead, and they are definitely shorter than our beautiful giraffes here. Now, talking about that size, that size is not only for their long legs, they're known, of course, for their long necks. Miles poking his neck out right here, kind of giving you a good display. Now, that neck, how it became to be so long, is actually debated by scientists. There's two major theories. One is a theory that was proposed by Charles Darwin himself. Um, and his theory was that there was an advantage to being able to eat the leaves on the top of the trees that no one else had access to. So if you are competing with other animals and you're eating from the bottom of the bushes, the giraffes that had the ability just by their height to eat a little bit extra because they were taller were the ones that then survived and were able to pass on 
their genetics. And so over time and over time, you saw that it was mostly tall giraffes instead of short giraffes. Now that's just one theory. In science, we usually have a lot of theories. Um, theory number two has to do with their mating behavior. Now their mating behavior is known as necking. Now these guys, of course, look very serene and docile, but if you put a lady and two males in a room, things can get a little bit wild. So when two males are fighting over breeding rights, they will actually take their necks and slam them into each other. Um, it's a fighting behavior. Um, it can get quite gnarly. And the animals just by velocity that had the longer necks were able to then create higher velocity, having the ability to probably knock over their opponent um, or at least cause a little bit more damage than the other were the ones that then won their breeding rights. Now, it's probably a combination um, of things that created their long necks. Uh, the preservation of a species is rarely determined by one single advantage. Um, but despite the fact that they do have really long necks, they don't have extra vertebrae. A lot of people would assume that to get a taller giraffe, you would just stick a couple extra bones in there. Instead of having more bones, their bones are just extremely large. Their bones are also very dense to be able to lift, and then their muscles are incredibly dense. But when you have something like a long neck, an adaptation that definitely helps them survive, it comes with a couple setbacks as well. Um, because they have such a long neck, they have to have huge hearts, very, very big hearts. Um, and that is, a, of course, a physical hearts, but we also here at the zoo think metaphorically they do have big, big hearts as well, especially our guys here. Um, but the thick hearts have to work really hard to keep that blood circulated and pump that blood all the way up to the tippy top of their heads. They also have to have thicker blood vessels, especially in the walls of their lower extremities. So that helps them uh, withstand increased hydrostatic pressure, and that dampens the like potential catastrophic change in blood pressure from if they are having their heads up or down. Most of the time, hey Miles, he's coming to say hi a little bit closer now. Most of the time, you're going to see them in this upright position, but when they drink or he's giving you a display, he can also lean his head down to say hello to people. Um, if he didn't have those thick blood vessels, the change in pressure uh, would make him pretty dizzy. It wouldn't make him feel good. Kind of similar um, to how if you get up and down really quick and you see a bunch of gray spots, um, that would be basically every time they took a drink if they didn't have that ability to have their thick, thick extremities. Now, if anyone knows about breathing, um, of course they have really long necks. He's showing his really long tongue off now a little bit too. Um, but the diaphragm is attached to the throat in all mammals. So the longest neck will have, of course, the largest diaphragm. And another adaptation that's caused by those long necks is that their stomachs had to evolve. When they are grazing at the very, very tippy tops of trees, they do have a couple favorite plants. They definitely like the acacia tree, um, but at the top, there is a little bit less ability to discriminate toxic and non-toxic plants. So these guys have the ability to eat what would normally be toxic for most mammals uh, with their stomachs. So occasionally they, they may take something that would be a uh, definitely not tasty to most and still be able to digest it. Uh, the leaves at the top of trees are also not really um, the most beautiful leaves. They're going to be dry, they're going to have the most exposure, and so they've been able to adapt stomachs that are able to turn that food, even if it's not the nicest looking of food, still into vital energy. And speaking of energy, a lot of people ask when our giraffes sleep. And they don't sleep very often. They actually sleep about 30 minutes or less every day. So I know that if I only got 30 minutes of sleep, I would not be a very happy gal, but that's all a happy giraffe needs. And a lot of times they will sleep in micro naps of just 30 seconds to five minutes at a time. So when our keepers are doing their training sessions and they're not responding, uh, it could be that they're just standing there, taking a nap fully with their eyes open and just get in their sleep when they can. And that would help them, of course, to keep a lookout from predators. And we will talk a little bit more about predators shortly. So all of that knowledge is basically to say that with every advantage comes its own challenges. So while the giraffe 
were able to develop these extremely beautiful lawn necks that they're known for. It's not been without the need to adapt to that adaptation itself. Now, another thing that, of course, being tall and big makes difficult is traveling. So in the book that you guys have been reading, I'm going to try not to do too many big spoilers um, in case you guys are not all the way through the story, if you're like halfway like I am. Um, but there is a lot of traveling in this book. Um, our giraffes actually arrive by sea. Um, the elevation changes that the uh, the hurricane and the rough seas uh, caused were overcome by wild girl and her companion but the, just barely and we still have challenges when it comes to transporting animals today we have specially made cargo containers that we have to rely on as well as our training and animal bonds to have the animals willingly choose to enter a transport container we never force these animals uh, it is always going to be by their choice to do any type of behavior. If that's from a small training procedure, um, if it's to getting a hoof trim, um, or even moving into a transport container. Uh, but to make it less stressful, if they do need to go somewhere uh, to do life-saving species uh, work, you know, having that bond is going to help them a lot. I think they they may hear their keeper in the back area. They're all walking that way. So typically that bond also means they have to check up on their keepers whenever they can. Now, we actually had um, uh, one of our giraffes recently go to another facility. Um, that was because he has extremely diverse genetic uh, material and he will be an important asset to his species. So when he was transported, uh, we actually had to call one of two transport companies that have the ability uh, for the just the container that's specialized for the giraffes to move. And then all of our keepers um, from practicing their training every single day uh, became pretty much a walk in the park. Um, they're used to then having, you know, okay, someone's coming up, they're asking for this behavior, I come into this behavior. And all that training is so that if they need medical checkups, if they're being transported, that it's not stressful on the animals themselves. But why do we go through all of this work and all of the stress of going from one place to another. Uh, why don't we just keep all of our giraffes right here? Uh, we are, as I mentioned, part of the AZA. So that's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And one of the very important programs that we now have here is called the SAFE program. And that stands for Saving Animals from Extinction Program. About 100 institutions have giraffes currently, but they've been going through a silent crisis in the wild. Their wild numbers are dropping with pretty much zero notice. Uh, the giraffes have had a 40% decrease of their wild populations. That leaves, again, less than 100,000 giraffes left in Africa. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, part is uh, habitat fragmentation um, and habitat loss. The fact that our human population keeps growing and growing and poaching. Um, we're actually involved in giraffe conservation at the Greenville Zoo by participating in the AZA Giraffe Safe Program. Um, that includes giraffe research, field work, public awareness, and action. And we also participate in the SSP. And the SSP stands for the Species Survival Program. That's a program that ensures that the genetic diversity in our captive populations is safeguarded for the species. Um, and that is why we had our giraffe, Kellen, go to another facility. He was born here and now he's at the Potawatomi Zoo in Indiana. And it's taken him, you know, it took him several hours to be loaded onto the transport, it took him several hours to get to Indiana, but now he's been accepted into his new herd and he has the opportunity to contribute to his species and save them. And that's the work that we do even at a tiny zoo here in Greenville as part of our partnerships with other AZA zoos. Greenville Zoo and AZA also understands that to protect giraffes, we can't be animal minded alone. Um, before becoming a zoo educator, I was actually a zookeeper for 12 years. Um, so I definitely have uh, what I call keeper brain. Everything's animals, animals, animals all the time. But if you're only focused on the animal, it's actually not the best thing to protect them because there's always a human element as to why these numbers are dropping in the wild. We partner with wildlife allies at private and academic institutions to reach out to the local communities in Africa. 
the local community is going to understand these animals and their environment better than anyone on the outside, no matter how helpful we are trying to be. We have to include the people that are in those communities. If we work together, we can help both the animals and the environment as we work together as a team. Make sure I get him since he's coming up and saying hi again. That's Miles. So our Wildlife Alliance scientist and AZA collaborate with a group of people called the Twiga Lindsay. Uh, that's a Swahili word for giraffe guards. Um, these giraffe guards are located in Kenya. Um, it's typically where our reticulated giraffe are, and they carry on field studies, surveys, they monitor on the ground actions and actively protect giraffes right there in the wild. And those are just some of the groups that we are helping and working alongside. Um, we also have reached out to the Conservancy Rangers. So those are your, your active poacher um, groups that are gonna make sure that they're patrolling these areas and have the legal authority um, to take action if they find poaching. The majority of giraffe poaching occurs for different reasons in different communities though. Some communities find that poaching only occurs when food sources are limited and that's when they're used for their meat. That's typically what we see happening to the reticulated giraffes in Kenya. But other locations uh, are more financially motivated for trade. So the one type approach of only being animal minded has not been successful. And that's why AZA partnerships are working really hard to find why the specific communities are having issues and how we can help the pockets of animals. Because if we only look at the people or only look at the animals, we don't have that big picture. And the big picture is definitely what's needed to protect these amazing species and have them as we move forward. So they definitely have some action going on in the corner. Um, we have mom and daughter kind of checking out the corner here. And then Miles is this direction. So I am going to take a little walk here to the side. See if we can get a better look at Miles as he's hanging out. Miles, his personality does usually... Uh, have him being a little bit more eager to say hi to the public. Um, Mom Autumn, of course, is going to be more protective. She typically hangs a little further back. Um, she's teaching her baby to be very cautious as well. Now, the next portion, I am going to start walking to some of our next door neighbors um, that have a relationship with giraffes um, as we make our way behind the scenes. And we will be able to see the behind the scenes area of our giraffe barn. Um, and we'll have a special guest speaker who can talk a little bit more about the everyday care and husbandry that we do here to take care of our giraffes. But just in case they don't peek their heads in, make sure we get a good look while they're out here and make our way towards our next guest. He's checking for some leaves up there. Pretty sure he stripped that tree down before Autumn got the chance to have the leaves hit the ground, but he's got to double check. Now, Nancy, if there are any questions in the chat, this may be a good time. Um, yes, we have a lot of questions. We have a very <laughs> inquisitive group here. So the first one is, how often do giraffes lie down? So we don't see them lying down very often until, uh, well, when they're born is pretty much the most that you're going to see them laying down. I will touch a little bit on that when we meet my friends that are being noisy next door, if you hear a roar in the background. Um, but it's typically the babies that are going to be laying down several weeks after they're born. Otherwise, they stay on their feet. Um, as you can imagine, getting up and down when you're that tall um, can be a bit of a feat. So if they're on the ground, it's typically a sign we need to check on them um, or that there's something going on. Okay. I do hear the lions roaring. You're right. <laughs> they heard um, I was going to visit them next. <laughs> yeah. As, so in the book, and I wondered this too, they feed them onions all the time. Do giraffes really like onions? So I plan on asking that to our giraffe keeper okay. in the back. They get a different type of browse every single day. Um, 
I know that some of their favorites are bamboo, and I was going to see if we can actually look at some of the food that they're going to get today, because I was wondering the same thing. I was like, onions are a strange uh, food item to be that encouraged by. Um, so I'm going to hold that question for when we meet with Christine Deer. Okay, sounds great. Um, next question, could you talk about how they can kick from the front and back legs? Yes, yeah, so they have a very, very strong kick. Um, and it takes a lot of coordination for their balance, but that kick can actually save their lives. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how they defend themselves when we visit their predators. Okay. How long do the calves stay with their mothers in the wild? They're typically going to stay with their moms for up to a couple of years. It depends on when she gets pregnant again. Once she gets pregnant again, then it, that's when she kind of will kick the, the last calf out. Um, okay, and this might come up in the predator talk, but I'll go ahead and ask it here. Could you talk about the humming, thrumming sound that the book references, plus the wailing noise they make? So they are able to make a lot of vocalizations. Um, scientists still don't know what exactly the humming vocalization means. I looked this up specifically because I was like, okay, I know that there's going to be some sounds and giraffes have been told if no one's heard a giraffe, um, they sound like goats a lot. It's like a bleeding sound, um, that they'll make. And then they'll also do a humming sound and it's been recorded by multiple keepers, people working with them. Um, but we try not to anthropomorphize. Um, as well. So while we may think, oh, they're humming, you know, to each other, they're humming um, as a sense of uh, communication with us or to their other giraffes, we don't have enough research to really back up why they're making these sounds. Um, we typically see the bleeding is a distress sign. Um, the humming, we like to assume, is probably a more uh, friendly sound to each other, but we just don't have that research to say definitively. Okay. Um, next question, do you have an association with SCBI, which is Smithsonian Conservation Biological Institute in Front Royal, Virginia, which is part of the Smithsonian Zoo? They breed rare breeds and engage in research. I believe that we partner with them because they're associated with AZA. Um, I don't know about that specific organization, but I can definitely look into it and get back to you guys. Okay. Um, are captive giraffes, captive breed giraffes, ever released into the wild in Africa? Um, I know that they have in the past. Um, right now, the focus has been for genetic preservation more than release. Until we're able to really stabilize what's happening in the wild, if we're releasing into the wild, our successes of them surviving are not as high um, there's kind of an approach that has to be from several angles. So one is making sure that we have genetic diversity in the captive population so that when we have babies and things are a little bit better in the wild, we can then have those programs. And um, while it has happened historically, um, right now our focus has been on making sure that that genetic viability is there. Okay, I have several more questions. Can we keep going? Or are, we, are we good on time? Um, we can take a couple more questions. Okay. What is the range of giraffes in Africa beyond Kenya? Um, so you're going to see your different pockets of giraffes in different areas of Africa. Um, they will roam quite far, um, but that's where you're going to see your specific species grouped in different areas. Um, the Maasai are from the Maasai region. Northern and southern giraffes have several subspecies. Um, so it depends on which groups in particular, um, but they all are all over Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa. I believe that answers the question. Okay, um, I so. If I, I can also kind of get more information too. <laughs> okay. Um, so somebody wants to know, I mean, they've got a pretty good habitat there, but do they get a chance where they can really run? Do they have a larger place where they can exercise? Um, so they do actually run in this area quite a bit. Uh, most of the time they're going to reserve their energies though. Same as in the wild, you're not going to see a giraffe really take off and run unless there is a threat. Um, whereas I know that sometimes um, humans will go on pleasure runs. Um, I'm not one of those humans myself, um, but these guys are pretty much going to conserve their energy and, and less threatened. Uh, they will walk around their exhibit. Um, and of course, Providence, our young one, she'll, t she'll pick up a good run herself um, but that's more to get her muscles developed. Most of the time, though, um, our male and female adults are, are a little bit lazy. They're a bit pampered. Okay. Um, how did these giraffes respond to the loss of their companion that was moved to another zoo? Um, we haven't seen too much distressing behavior. Um, Autumn seems to be a little bit more... Um, 
thriving when it comes to not having to share her attention, um, where Kellen was kind of pushing on her a little bit more, um, where she's trying to devote more of her time and energy towards her youngest. Um, so we haven't seen any detrimental effects, but again, I don't want to anthropomorphize or, or assume. So if there's something going on as well, um, while we don't have anything to back that up with our science, then, um, yeah, we haven't. We don't. We don't see anything that would okay. lead to that. But we also don't want to assume that that we know from okay. their perspective. I, I think you said this at the very beginning, and I think someone came in late. Which remind us which variety of giraffe these are. Oh, this is the Maasai giraffe. So okay. that's M A S A I giraffe. Um, and so several questions here. Do they ever have more than one baby at a time? Can they have twins? It's not likely for them to have twins. Um, the gestation period is 15 long months, and it's typically all devoted to a single calf. Um, and it's a lot of uh, energy that they have to keep up with um, for their care for their children. So um, while I'm not saying there's never been twins, it's, it's not the norm for them. Okay. Do they have knee issues since they stand so much and they're so tall? Um, they're pretty well adapted to be able to stand. Um, if they had knee issues, um, they would not be able to live their entire lives on the feet. Again, they don't go to sleep like laying down. They stay on their feet all the time. Um, they have some very strong ligaments. They have very strong structures in their muscles. So um, they are happy on their feet. Okay. And then you might get to this when we meet, go in the back, but um, hoof trimming, how, how do you do that? And are they cooperative? So that is going to be a question for our zookeeper. Okay. Um, I will make sure that when we get to the front, um, I'll ask her particularly about our hoof trimming as well as our onion questioning because I am dying okay. to know that answer. Great. And then one last question. Well, two, um, the person who asked about habitats or about where they live in Africa wants to know if he'll see um, giraffes in Ghana. Do you know the answer to that? I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. We'll have to look that up. Um, and then is breeding artificial? Oh no, our okay. male Miles, he is um he is very excited when he gets to be with his lady. That's all I'm gonna say and keep it PG there, but we don't have to do anything artificially with him. <laughs> okay. And then one last question, and then that's all I've got right now. We'll stop so you can move on to the next thing. What is the function of the umbrella structures that there's we see so on the, it, um... it does serve as an additional shade spot, but the majority of the time we use it as an enrichment area. So if you see there's an orange bucket, I don't know if you can see it from mm -hmm. where I'm standing now, that orange bucket there, we fill with different treats every day. We'll also take the bucket down and put different things like a whole pile of bamboo sticks, um, balls with strange smells on them. Um, and that's just so that we give them something to investigate and then use their complex needs, uh, their mental facilities these make sure that um, you know they're not just here standing and nothing changes there's a lot of change and excitement and discovery the same way that they would in the wild okay well that's all of our questions so we're ready for the next next segment and everybody she's gonna move to another spot so it might be a little like a little seasick here for a minute but then we'll be at our next habitat i'm gonna try my best to be steady here okay. um and i'll probably um when you send me the chat, go through and get some more thorough information too, um, to make sure that I make all of our answers as accurate as possible. So let's see. Oh, we've got a lion here. So this is one of our lions here at the Greenville Zoo. This looks like Saeed. Uh, we do have two half brothers. They were born about six weeks apart from each other. And we can tell it's Saeed because his mane is very nice and luscious and dark. Um, he does typically have a little bit more testosterone. So that testosterone displays in that dark coloration. Um, when you saw our giraffes as well, you may have noticed that Miles has a darker pattern. And that's also a hint to higher testosterone levels. Um, I don't know where our dear friend Chuma, his younger brother is. He may be inside. Um, they do have access to go inside and outside throughout the day. Now, these are one of the predators of giraffes, which is why I'm taking a little pit stop to say hello to them. Um, when we think of predators, of course, uh, humans are number one on the list, unfortunately, but lions are often brought up. Um, lions do eat giraffes, but they don't eat them very often, and that's because it's pretty risky and it's a very tough hunt. 
Um, it's not something that uh, they would take on by themselves. When they do hunt giraffe, they target the young and the helpless. Usually it's slower pregnant or older weaker individuals and they'll attack from behind. Uh, then they have them kind of stumble onto the ground and then they choke them. It's kind of gruesome um, and it takes a lot of, lot of work. Um, about 75% of young giraffe in the wild do not survive. Um, that's because of predators like lions. Uh, and that is because those baby giraffes need to lay on the ground for several weeks after birth. It's the most vulnerable time of their lives is shortly after they're born. Uh, the mothers will try to, of course, defend them. Um, but sometimes if they're on the ground, they're pretty much a sitting duck. Um, and they're just very, un you know, they're unable to kick if they're laying down. They're defensive. Um, lions, uh, they, of course, they're never going to try to take on a giraffe by themselves. Um, because it's also dangerous for them to be able to go and hunt. Um, their success rate would basically be zero unless they had the whole pride or the whole hunt pack working together. Um, so they work together as a team uh, and they assault the giraffes from a number of points. Um, like that one question that we have about their kicking, um, they will basically try to overwhelm them by attacking from multiple vantage points to kind of distract the giraffe into kicking um, in the wrong directions so that a lion then can attack from behind. Uh, but a lot of times in the wild, you'll see that giraffes will have claw marks on their rump. Um, and that's because they have been successfully been able to throw off a line, um, but they're always on that rump area. Now, the reason that they do attack from behind is because their neck is incredibly thick. Their neck skin and their neck muscles are just really powerful and strong. So even with a lion's claws or teeth, it's not going to be easy to puncture those areas. Now, they have a couple ways to defend themselves from attacks, though. Uh, the giraffes, um, you know, one single well-targeted kick can injure or kill an adult lion immediately. Um, they can run pretty fast, so giraffes can run about 37 miles per hour. And while lions can go about 50 miles per hour, they have that 360-degree view, and that helps them see before they actually attack. So they don't sleep very often. They're up on their feet. They have their heads looking around and that's what's going to alert them first that, oh, a line's coming. Even though I can't go 50, I'll, I'll kick it up to 37 and get out of here. Um, but those are pretty much the main defenses that the giraffe have is their ability to see, their ability to run, and their ability to kick. So when they are those baby giraffes sitting down on the ground, that's when you're going to see um, lions, occasionally hyenas, um, come and try to take a stab at eating a giraffe. So while it's not something they do as often as, you know, oh, it's Friday night, it's giraffe night, um, it's going to be something less frequent. Um, but they are one of the predators of giraffes. Um, if anyone has questions about generally uh, lions or giraffes at this point, um, I'm going to slowly kind of continue our way to the behind the scenes area. I'm not seeing any questions right now about the lions, but I'll give people a minute to pop them in the chat. I'm going to peek around and see if I can find Chuma. Oh, there's Chuma. He heard me. So that's our other half brother. Now, sometimes I do get the question of why there are two boy lions hanging out together, not fighting. Um, that is because we do not have a female lion. So the female lions will produce a pheromone that makes the guys go crazy. And um, as long as we don't introduce a girl, you know, same as people in that way, uh, two guys and a pretty lady, they're going to fight even if they're brothers. Uh, but they have been together for about 16 years. So they are old, happy lions. So Chim is coming up over there. We do have a question. Is it scary for the giraffes to hear the lions roar? Um, they really don't react. Um, they're pretty desensitized to it. They are right next door to each other. And honestly, they would hear lions roaring in the wild along with other various calls of animals. Um, here, they, they're used to knowing. They're like kind of, oh, it's the, the neighbors again. You know, they're, they're making a ruckus. Um, but they don't really have a, a real reaction to them anymore. These guys do roar just about every morning and every afternoon. So uh, they definitely are used to it. If anything, it's more of an alarm clock for them because it's pretty consistent during which times that looks like Chim is rubbing his face on some leaves right there. 
Um, do they have, do giraffes have other predators besides lions or is that the main one? Lions are going to be your main ones. Hyenas are going to be the second, but number one is always humans. Unfortunately, we are the bad guys. Okay. I think that's all of our lion questions. All right. So I'm going to start walking towards our behind the scenes area. Um, if you notice that there's not a lot of people here, the zoo is actually closed for its annual maintenance. Every year we close down for two weeks. That's when we do all of our tree cutting, get all of our fresh paint. Um, and get, basically get ready for the next season. Um, so you guys are able to come at a very nice and quiet, peaceful time. Um, it is a beautiful day out, so most of our animals have access. The giraffes like it to be at least 45 degrees or above before they come out, but most of the time we will let them have access inside or outside, and that's their choice. Um, since our vultures are out, I will stop and say hi to them. It's another one of our African species. These are our griffins vultures. We have two females here. And we're gonna continue along the way. I'm gonna give us a radio call so our keeper knows that we're heading back her direction. Go for Christine. Our virtual tour is heading your direction and we'll be there within five minutes. Ten four, I'm up at giraffe. Ten four. So past this gate, we are behind the scenes. This is our education building. We do have classes for just about all ages. And on this side, this is where our keepers. Maxine, I don't know if you can hear me. We lost you for a minute. I know you said that you might be connecting from one Wi-Fi to the next. So if you can hear me, you might want to restate whatever you said or wait till you get to a, the next spot where we know it's clear. And I remember she told me that we might have a little bit of a wonky connection while she moves to that building. So just stay tuned. Make sure our signal's strong. Yeah, Maxine, we're, we're back now. Anything you might have oh. said in the past minute and a half, we didn't hear you, but. Um, well, we were just walking up the hill. I, I know, and, and that's our wonky them. spot. Um, I'm gonna walk slow and make sure that we keep our signal strong. Yeah, that's fine. I told them that you said we might have a little, <laughs> um, yeah, there, yeah. All right, good. We have ourselves back online. We lose each, every time in that spot. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to be taking him and speaking in headphones on, but so that we can both communicate with each other. Um, it's going to be a little bit of change in sound for everybody. All right, so I'm going to let Christine introduce herself. Uh, you're fine. I'll point at you. <laughs> you're good. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm one of the animal care supervisors here at the Greenville Zoo. And one of the areas I oversee is the African exhibit. And I understand you guys want to see our behind the scenes for a giraffe and learn a little bit about how we help take care of them. Okay. Um, if you'll follow me this way, we'll start out in our feed room. And right here is where we keep all of our, all of our food items. They get a variety of food. These are the favorites for treats. They're called leaf eater biscuits. They're actually uh, made for monkeys, but our giraffe, especially our male, loves them. <laughs> now, one of the questions that we had, the giraffes in the book they're reading, they really like onions. 
Is that true of our giraffes? That is not true of our giraffe. Our giraffe are incredibly picky. It took years to get them to even like sweet potatoes, which is normally giraffe candy. So it took a while. And honestly, we were using these for years before we even retried the sweet potatoes for the fourth time. Um, our female is not a fan of these, but our male is. Our calf noodles or Providence is slowly starting to get a little more into them, but she actually likes baby food. So she'll get banana baby food. <laughs> banana baby food, not the onion. So that not sounds a little bit so better much. bananas. <laughs> um, I do have elephants that really liked onions though. Um, but basically, you know how you feed your dog dog food, your cat cat food? We feed our giraffe giraffe food. It's a commercially prepared diet that is basically ground up alfalfa with some added vitamins and minerals. And basically that's, all of the stuff that they would need. We also, since that's not terribly filling, we also supplement with alfalfa hay. In the wild, they would eat primarily leaves, uh, browse, things that come from the trees and stuff. They're not really grazers. They don't eat from the ground, but the acacia tree in the wild is pretty much the staple of their diet. So while we can't necessarily offer them acacia, we try to offer them the exact same balance as far as proteins, fats, and um, all of that stuff. Over here is our enrichment wall. Since in the wild, they would spend majority of their time eating and basically walking from food full source to food source. Our animals have their food brought to them. So they don't necessarily get as much exercise and food is pretty much eaten a lot quicker. So they have a lot more time on their hands. So what we try to do is try to stimulate those natural uh, feeding behaviors. You'll notice we have a lot of items that have holes in them or spinny things or things that look like wood branches that have little obstacles. So what we'll do is we will put their food in these items and that way it takes them a little bit longer to get them out and it will also stimulate how they would eat in the wild. See in the wild, they take that long tongue, they snake it into the acacia thorns, grab the leaf, bring it back, pluck it down and yummy leaf for the giraffe. Um, this way we can keep the behaviors as natural as possible. You know, we don't want giraffe, they're used to basically eating out of a giant dog food bowl. We want to keep them as wild as possible and try to preserve those behaviors so that when everyone comes out to the zoo and they come visit, they're getting as close to the wild animals as we can possibly give them. Now, one of the questions that we had earlier was if they run a lot. I know I've seen Providence do a cute gallop, um, mm -hmm. but our other guys seem pretty lazy. They're also a little bit older. Um, Autumn, our female, she'll get a little bit spazzy sometimes and she gets spooked and she'll take off running and it'll just be like, oh, quick, what was that? But again, it's the flight or flight response and they are prey animals. Their absolute first instinct is gonna be to take off running. Their second instinct is gonna be to keep those hooves up, so. <laughs> okay, um, we can go into the barn now so you can see where they stay at night. <laughs> to keep our hallway, which is very boring. People will lift me. I'm walking slow for our signal to make sure that I follow along. So we're inside one of the stalls currently. So we can. Perfect. <laughs> we can go over and see her. We are actually in her stall right now. This is um, Autumn's stall. It's a little it's taller little than your normal stall. Up in smiles. She's a big fan. Do you guys want to meet Miles? Basically, for giraffe, they have about an inch of height, for, or up to the height for an inch of tongue. So he's just under 18 feet. This tongue is roughly 18 inches. <laughs> He's a very good boy. He just had a birthday not too long ago. <laughs> but generally, when the temperature allows it, we, uh, let's go back like that since he's going to take a on it. Um, when the temperature allows it, we like to let them have access. So they have a choice. They can come in the barn or they can go out in the yard. In the winter, it gets a little bit cooler. So if it's below 50 ish or so, depending on wind chill, then they will have to stay inside at night. And what we do is we keep mom and baby in these two stalls and daddy stays on the far end. <laughs> um, if you want to come check out their kids' diets. <laughs> this is Providence's diet. <laughs> so she gets her grain ration and beet pulp, which is basically a lot of fiber. So it's extra good and filling for them. And we also offer enrichment multiple times a day. 
tonight they are getting the PVC puzzle feeders. So they have extra treats that are hidden in there. And to help with their mineral intake, we also have mineral blocks. We do uh, have I a like question it. if they know your voice. They do. <laughs> they do. And he knows that my voice usually means food, so that's why he's getting a little bit antsy. <laughs> Here, and I can show you a little bit of our training devices. This is called a GRD. It's a giraffe restraint device. If any of you guys are familiar with cattle shoots, it's basically a large cattle shoot. So there's a scale in the bottom, and they are trained to go through it every single day before they go out in the yard. First, the last thing they do is they walk through the GRD. Uh, we can weigh them any day just by stopping them on this top and taking the weight. And all of these windows right here open up. So, uh, excuse, me. <laughs> oh, excuse me, alfalfa, it does it to me every time still after all these years. Uh, but the windows open up so we can access various body parts. If we want to keep the hooves away from our face, but we want to get near the chest, we can open up this window. Mm -hmm. But that way, whatever we need to get to, we can. And the giraffe are used to being in here. They're used to the doors being shut. They know that when they're in here, that means a huge jackpot of yummy treats is coming. So it's actually pretty calming for them. Uh, we have platforms up top. We do blood draws from the jugular. We have also done uh, blood draws from the fetlock joint too. Because sometimes Autumn is a little bit antsy about her neck, but she's fine with her feet. So we'll draw from the vein right there. Ah. Hmm. Uh, Enrichment from last night, but you can see Miles, he's getting all sorts of anx anxious. Basically, we try to swap out enrichment daily. We'll have different enrichment in the yard and different enrichment in the barn. Mm -hmm. All of our guys are blood trained. Well, Providence is still in progress, but she's made remarkable progress. Uh, Miles here is actually a donor. Oh. So what we do is we'll do large volume collections on him. Giraffe calf are prone to a condition called failure of passive transfer, which means that all the immunities that the mom has might not necessarily pass to the calf. And the best course of treatment for that is plasma from the full grown giraffe. And not a lot of giraffes really want to part with two liters worth of plasma. So basically what we do is we'll take a liter of blood at a time, spin it down, save the plasma, freeze it. And then if there's never another zoo or even us, if we have an issue with a calf, then we have that bank so that we have it on hand in case we need it. Mm -hmm. One of our questions that we had is if you guys do hoof trims. We actually have not had to, but I can show you the block that we use for that. We've not had to do an actual trim, but they are trained and conditioned for it. Basically, they'll allow us to, well, I'm trying to think of this. This is actually the spot where we do it. Sorry, I have a little bit. Um, what we do is we take two fire hose that go along right here, and we place a foot lock right here. The trainer will sit here, the giraffe will place its foot there, and then you can work on it from a relatively protected area since you're behind these bars, you're safe. And the, what the giraffe does is curl its hook backwards so that you've got uh, the bottom of the, the bottom of the hoof to work with. Uh, basically with giraffe, sedation is not a good thing. It's kind of a last ditch effort. So anything that you need to do with them, you need to train them how to do it. You need to have access to their entire bodies. They need to be comfortable with touch. Now, one of our questions is how dangerous are they to work with? Uh, they are very, very big and they can be potentially very dangerous. They are technically considered a class one animal, which is the most dangerous animal that we work for, which is the most dangerous class of animals that we work with. They're considered as dangerous as a lion. <laughs> But again, we try to maintain safety as much as possible. We always keep barriers between us and them uh, during foot work. That this will be a barrier, that will be a barrier. Space between the kicky parts will be a barrier. <laughs> but we just need to keep in mind that they are very large animals. Miles here weighs about 2,500 pounds. So we have to keep that in mind. His head weighs about 200, so it can be a giant wrecking ball if you're not careful. Mm. Are they ever brushed? Miles is the only one that actually likes being brushed. Huh. The females are not a big fan of it, but they tend to be a little bit softer and have silkier fur than he does. He tends to get a little coarse and rough. What he loves is taking a giant deck brush and just <laughs> going to town on his back or up back behind his legs. He loves that. 
which is very unusual for a giraffe. I will put that out there. But actually, you might be in the way. We do have a giant car wash brush in the yard back there that's on a spinner so that they can rub up against that and brush themselves. And a lot of times they'll feel more comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. Do they usually shed a lot or do they get thicker fur in winter? Well, the babies, when they're born, they tend to have really thick, fluffy fur. And then as they get older, especially over that first six months to a year, it starts to get a little bit uh, thinner and more refined. As far as seasonal coat changes, there really isn't all that much. I found that the males tend to be a bit greasier than the females. Females tend to be softer. And Mr. Man here will leave uh, grease trails all over everything that he touches. <laughs> Now we've touched a little bit on transport. I have another question about uh, the transport process. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about when they move from one place to another? The book that they read is about the first giraffes that came and went from the East Coast all mm -hmm. the way over to California. So um, a bit of a journey. Our very first male came from the San Diego Zoo. So he had a pretty similar journey. Um, basically, this right here, we call it our transport chute and the loading chute. So what we'll do is the giraffe calf, when we start thinking about moving them, we start working with them so that they will come out this door with their head facing where Miles is now. We'll shut this door. So it's basically just an, uh, a container. It's a four by eight container. We'll get the babies used to going in there, being shut in. That's what they do before they go out in the yard. It's just an everyday deal. And then one morning, we'll have a truck there when the door opens. And rather than going into the yard, they will just go onto the truck. <laughs> and the truck is basically like a modified uh, horse trailer. Um, it's, it's a little low to the ground, about yay high. And it's got a ramp so that they can walk up the ramp. But I've seen some that are really fancy that have hydraulics that lift up 20 feet. So the giraffe walks in with his head tall. And then you bring it down just a little bit when they're when they travel they travel with their head forward a little bit but that way you can also fit under those big bridges <laughs> but giraffes tend to be relatively calm when they're in transport um all the modern trailers they have cameras so the drivers can see what's going on at all times they have eyes on the giraffe they have uh, hay feeders um uh, usually what you'll do is you'll fill up their water tanks here so that they're drinking the water that they're used to drinking and we'll always send them with their normal food, their normal hay, so that nothing really changes other than the location. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait for about one minute if anyone has additional questions for Christine. Um, while those questions are coming in, what's your favorite part about working with giraffes? Oh gosh, the personalities. Uh, they are very lively animals and they each have very, very distinct personalities. Don't tell the others, but Autumn is my favorite animal at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and one of our questions is, where do they typically sleep at night? Uh, it depends. Like I said, if they have access, they tend to prefer to be outside. But inside, they tend to stay on their mats. They will catnap standing up for two or three minutes, or they'll lay down and tuck their heads and get a slightly longer rest. The babies tend to do that more than the parents. Uh, but there are quite a few mornings when I'll come in and mom and dad will be sitting down. Mm -hmm. That's surprising. All right, so I'm keeping an eye on any other additional questions. Now, if you guys do think of questions that as soon as we leave our program today, um, Nancy will have my email and we will do our best to get back and make sure everyone's answers um, are given. And I am going to save the chat and share that with Maxine. So anything that we didn't cover or that there were one or two, she, Maxine had lots of great answers. I know there were one or two questions she was going to research. So we will, um, when we get those answers back, we'll post them where y'all can find them and let you know that we have that. And I did see that question about lifespan. I have a Maasai, it's 25 is their maximum. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it's different for the males and females. Oh. Males, if they get to be 20, that's usually a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. um, basically in the wild, their mortality rate gets skewed because there's a 50% infant mortality. 50% of all babies born will not live the year. So that messes up the wild ones. But females, I've, I've known several that live to be their early 30s. <laughs> that's remarkable. That's very remarkable. It's, very, very good standard of care for them. But yes, uh, 
the females living into their 20s is pretty good. <laughs> And we had a, uh, a comment so that they're very fortunate to be in your care. Uh-huh. Well, thank you. We, we enjoy taking care of them. They are wonderful animals. So we're going to start walking out of the barn area back into um, just our regular behind the scenes. If you have questions, I'm keeping my eye on, but I'm also keeping an eye on the floor so I don't trip over here. <laughs> Take in some views of how tall our building is back here. Definitely giraffe height. Thank you, Christine. Bye, everybody. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn back to my face again. There I am. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining me talking about giraffes, um, being able to see them up close and behind the scenes. Definitely take the time to come and visit us in person as well. Um, our giraffes love when people come and visit, especially Miles. As you see, his head will drip down and uh, say hi pretty much when anyone comes up. Um, they love to be adored by their public. Um, I will answer as many questions as I can. Uh, if you send those to the email, I just have been uh, really appreciative um, to be introduced to um, the Ollie Institute and to also uh, be able to join you guys on reading this story. Uh, it's not something that I, I picked up myself, but I've been really uh, fortunate to be able to uh, kind of join your reading club. Uh, but thank you so much and thank you, Nancy. Uh, I, I'm gonna go say goodbye now from Greenville. Yeah, thank you so much, Maxine. This was fabulous. You're getting lots of thanks in the chat. I will send you these questions and we really appreciate it. You have a good night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks a bunch. See you later. Yeah. Yeah, I think she has checked out, but um, I, I hope everybody enjoyed that. As you know, we were recording, um, so we will share that on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow. And I will save the chat and send her those questions as she was so generous to say she'd make sure she got all the answers back to us. So once we have those, we'll probably share in Ollie notes where you can read the, all of her answers. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.